Um, so I'm going to begin with just a couple of minutes of scene setting before Sam kicks off and uh, just to remind us about how far we've come. So let me just share my screen. I'm assuming you can all see that. Okay. So just to, to go back in time a bit, you remember that um, since the 1990s, there's been calls for wider availability of naloxone. And, you know, back in 1995, the Italians really started with um, enabled, enabling people to buy naloxone from community pharmacies in Italy, which was uh, pretty amazing, really. And then in uh, 2000, um, we saw um, what became known as the heroin drought or the heroin shortage. We had a, a fantastic reduction in, in overdoses from opioids, which is great. And we saw increased concern about methamphetamine and really the momentum for more widespread availability of naloxone really fell away, understandably. And then in 2009, um, we began to see opioid overdoses increasing. They obviously hadn't gone away totally, but we saw them on an upward trend again. And a number of us started calling for a wider availability of naloxone. And then in 2012, uh, in Canberra, um, Karma uh, began its um, program. Karma, the, um, the uh, consumer organisation in the ACT, began its program. Um, which we were involved in an evaluation of, and that was closely followed by um, programs in New South Wales and WA, South Australia, Queensland and Victoria. And what happened was the, the evaluation showed that um, these schemes were viable, um, that knowledge was improved and lives were saved um, using naloxone um, to help manage overdoses. But there was a question about scale up, about how to move from these pilots to something where there was broader coverage. We got support for that um, when in 2014, the WHO endorsed making naloxone more widely available. And then in 2016, the TGA here rescheduled naloxone to make it available both on prescription as it was, but also importantly over the counter through pharmacies. And that was after um, using some of the data from those evaluations and some strong uh, cross sector advocacy um, for those changes, which was fantastic to see. And then in 2019 to 21, we had the uh, federal PBS subsidised take home naloxone pilot, uh, where naloxone was available for, for free in South Australia, New South Wales and WA. And then in November of that year, um, we saw PBS listing of naloxone and we saw the availability of the intranasal form through the uh, through not, uh, Nixoid, which is a major development in terms of um, more widespread um, dis distribution of naloxone. In 2022, we saw the UQ um, pilot evaluation recommending that naloxone be made free nationally. And then uh, in July this year, we saw that happen, which was fantastic. So just reflecting on some of the themes, you know, what we've seen across the last 20 plus years has been a cross-sector cooperation and support right from the beginning with people across, um, you know, drug user organisations, um, government government bodies, um, regulators, um, uh, you know, researchers, um, clinicians, um, bureaucrats, and a, a whole bunch of people across the sector really working together to make this happen. And the model has been really about enabling pilots to occur, evaluating them and really wanting diffusion from one location to the next rather than sitting around and waiting for perfect policy. And, you know, there, there are lots of um, hurdles which have been overcome over time. And we've seen expansion into new settings. Um, you know, we've now got um, pilots happening in terms of policing, which you're going to be hearing about today, um, programs in ambulance, alcohol and drug treatment agencies, obviously programs in prisons, a whole wide range of things, new programs in community pharmacy, many different settings, and also with new target groups moving away from people who inject drugs um, to, to also expand into um, pain patients and, and, and other settings. And I guess what we've seen is that over this last 20 odd years, we've seen science addressing some of the barriers that have been there for more widespread availability and also evaluating these pilots and the work that's going to be presented today is going to continue that story. So with that, um, I'll uh, leave you to Sam to uh, present um, the first presentation for today. Thanks for your time.
Sorry. Um, I can see your slide there, Sam. Oh, uh, I'll just turn my video on as well. There we go. All right. Um, thanks so much, Simon. Um, so yeah, like Simon said, today I'm going to be providing a little bit of a background about tech naloxone and then get into some of the evidence on this concern of risk compensation, which I will describe in a second. Um, so I would also like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land and extend any uh, extend respect to any First Nations people joining us today and just also acknowledge the significance of the opportunity that we have to vote yes to a referendum that recognises our Aboriginal history. Um, so I assume if you're interested in this webinar, then you might have some sense of what take-home naloxone is. Um, but just to recap very quickly, naloxone is a life-saving antidote to opioid overdose. It's an opioid antagonist that binds to opioid receptors and immediately throws the recipient into opioid withdrawal. It lasts approximately 90 minutes, so it really acts as this temporary relief and an opportunity to get further help if necessary. Naloxone has no effect on people who do not have opioids in their system, so it's safe to administer to somebody who you suspect has overdosed, um, even if you're not sure what drugs they've taken. Um, like Simon said, programs that distribute naloxone to people in the community um, who may witness an overdose uh, have been termed take-home naloxone programs, and the idea is to train up people who are not clinically trained otherwise. Um, again, rehashing, but first program was established in the 90s and then in 2012, the first Australian program was implemented in Canberra. Um, so peer workers delivered workshops in prison and community settings that targeted people who were at risk of an overdose. This was primarily, primarily targeting people who use opioids or who are on opioid agonist treatment or who inject drugs. Um, and then since that time, every other state and territory has established programs, the most recent one being established in Darwin in 2022. So the program models do vary, um, but generally speaking, they have been delivered by peers and coordinated by advocacy groups. Uh, they include an intervention, brief or otherwise, to train people on how to recognise an opioid overdose and how to administer naloxone. So in these interventions, participants who would have um, historically received intramuscular naloxone, um, that's shown on the right there, would more recently be uh, uh, distributed intranasal spray, as Simon said, a huge advent, um, given, you know, breaking down barriers to administration for people. Um, now, obviously, I imagine everyone here is thinking, wow, how fantastic, there's a life-saving antidote that doesn't appear to have any negative side effects except for people um, who maybe don't want to go through withdrawal. But of course, naloxone hasn't been without its controversy. So in particular, there's been this concern um, documented among health professionals that people who use drugs with access to naloxone might engage in riskier behaviour. So risk compensation theory proposes that people typically adjust their behaviour in response to perceived levels of risk. So in the context of naloxone, um, this theory posits that people with naloxone perceive their risk of an opioid overdose as lower and therefore can increase their engagement in opioid overdose risk behaviours. In the literature, risk compensation has actually been primarily discussed in the context of HIV transmission. So, for example, with the advent of pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, there was concern that people would engage in riskier sexual practices that would ultimately negate the benefits of people being on PrEP in the first place. And this was substantiated by evidence finding that people on PrEP were more likely to, um, or the, there was an increase in incidence of STIs among this group. Uh, needle syringe exchange programs have fallen under similar scrutiny in that there was concern that making sterile injecting equipment available would result in an overall increase in risky injecting behaviour and harm, um, but this hasn't really been substantiated by the evidence. So in the context of naloxone and what behaviours may be of particular concern, we might consider risk compensation to result in an increase in any of these. So opioid increased opioid dose or frequency of use, um, on the flip side of that, um, you might consider the same dose or same frequency of use after a period of abstinence, a major risk factor for opioid overdose. Um, initiating fentanyl use or using substances that haven't been tested for fentanyl purity or concentration, obviously less of an issue in Australia at the moment, but a really major concern in the US and Canada. Um, the concomitant use of central nervous system depressants like benzodiazepines and alcohol, 
Uh, using drugs in a new setting increases the risk of overdose and using drugs alone also increases the risk of fatal overdose. Obviously, there's no one to respond if something happens to you. I've added an asterisk here because unlike the other risk factors, if you had naloxone on hand and were using alone, you would need to also think that you could respond to your own potential overdose. So it's obviously not impossible. There are about five to 10 minutes after injecting opioids before reaching peak, the peak effects. Um, but if you were compensating risk, then there's also this additional assumption that you have the confidence that you could intervene yourself. So in 2022, a systematic review was led by colleagues from Monash University that investigated this question of risk compensation in response to naloxone supply and tried to synthesize some of the evidence. So they were primarily interested in changes in heroin use, but also looked at changes in other substance use and change in overdose frequency after take home naloxone supply. Heroin use, there were five studies that documented changes in either quantity or days of use. Four of those found that there was no change and one study found an overall reduction in heroin use per day. There were five studies that looked at changes in use of other substances. All of them found no change in days or quantity of use or proportion of people using. And they looked at benzos, alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, prescription opioids, and cannabis. There were four studies that looked at overdose frequency. And the three found no change in overdoses before and after training. And then one found a reduction in opioid related emergency department attendances among people who had received THM training compared to people who hadn't received it. So while this is really promising, both is dead, did note some limitations. Um, primarily, these were studies that recruited people into a take home naloxone training program and they collected drug behaviour data sort of at baseline just before the intervention and just after the intervention, um, maybe a month or three months after the intervention. Some had control groups, but not many of them did and none were prospective studies. So there was also no controlling for potential confounders in most of the studies. Um, and the, the results were mainly looking at overall differences. So in addition, none of these studies formally analyzed changes in injecting frequency before and after training, um, which we know is one of the most important risk factors for overdose. So lots of gaps that we could potentially fill, uh, which is what we did. So in this study, we wanted to assess whether THN training and supply was associated with within person changes in overdose risk behaviors in a cohort of people, a prospective cohort of people who inject drugs. We use data from the Supermix cohort, which is a longitudinal cohort of people who regularly inject drugs um, at baseline in Melbourne. Participants indicated if they had received take home naloxone training and approximately when they had received it. So we only included participants who reported receiving training and, they all, and those who also had participated in the survey before the date that they had indicated. And we were only interested in their first reported training session. So we were also interested in the association between reporting take home naloxone training and injecting frequency primarily. But then we looked at these other outcomes, opioid injecting frequency, uh, frequency of benzodiazepine use, and then the proportion of time people reported using alone. We also identified some critical confounding variables that may be related to changes in injecting frequency and take home naloxone supply that were included in the model. Given this was a within person analysis, we were only interested in variables that were time varying. So we included housing stability, weekly income, a recent overdose, recent drug treatment, needle syringe coverage, which was the proportion of injections covered by a clean needle or a syringe, calendar year and time in the study. So this is just to kind of give an indication of um, what the data looked like. The top line shows the study timeline. So recruitment began in 2008, there were subsequent waves of recruitment in 2010 and 2017. The questions about needle syringe coverage were introduced in 2011, which is the latest time point for our, co our covariates that we were interested in or confounders. And so we excluded all preceding interviews before 2011. Take home naloxone training became available in Victoria in 2013. And then we introduced a question about take home naloxone training in 2017 into the survey. Interviews were conceptualised as pre-THN training in the green and post-THN training in the orange. 
And we only included one post-THN training measure for each outcome because we thought that the compensatory behaviour would only last as long as the naloxone was in date or on hand. So that was relatively arbitrary, but we thought that a 12-month period would be a little bit more reliable than including every time point after the take-home naloxone training was reported. So in this bottom line, you can see a fictional example of somebody's participation in relevant interviews. So this person was recruited in 2010 because that was before the 2011 cutoff that that particular survey was excluded. Um, they missed interviews in 2014 and 15. They were asked about their take home naloxone training in their 2018 interview after the um, question was introduced. In that interview, they said that they were trained in January 2017. Therefore, their 27 interview, uh, which for the purposes of this making sense, was conducted in February 2017, which is after their fictional training, but before the question was introduced in June. Um, so their last interview uh, that was included in the analysis was their 2017 interview. Their 2018 interview was excluded. So for this participant, they had four pre-training interviews that were in green, 2011, 12, 13, and 16, and then their last one in 2017, which were, was flagged as when they reported take-home naloxone training. And we did this because we really wanted to maximise the number of pre-training data points, even though it caused me an incredible headache. We ran fixed effects generalised linear multi-level models to examine the association between take-home naloxone training and our outcomes, and we controlled for the time-varying confounders that we identified. Estimates were expressed as incidence rate ratios with 95% confidence intervals, and we ran unadjusted and adjusted models as well, as you'll see in a second. We also ran sensitivity analyses, including the interview immediately before and immediately after THM training. So the idea there was to see if that um, there was a difference in the results if we included a shorter time period effectively between um, before and after training. And that included only two interviews per person. So in our main analysis, we found that there was no association between take-home naloxone training and any of our outcomes. So you can see here that the incidence rate ratios are all quite close to one, um, with the confidence intervals being quite wide, um, basically indicating that there was no association between reporting take-home naloxone training and changes in injecting frequency, opioid injecting frequency, using drugs alone or using benzos. Um, and you can see in the adjusted model, um, the incidence rate ratio is below one. So if anything, we're seeing a reduction in incidence, but obviously the confidence intervals are quite wide. We're not interpreting that as being significant. Looking at our sensitivity analyses, um, we found the same thing. Effectively, there was no difference. Um, so even after excluding all of those pre-training interviews, there was no real reduction. There, all of the incidence rate ratios were approximately one. To comment on some key limitations, we didn't measure the potency or quantity of drugs that we used, although we do believe that injecting frequency is a pretty good proxy measure for those things. Um, and also just to reiterate that the systematic review um, that I mentioned before, they didn't find any change in those outcomes from other studies. Um, participants might have access take home naloxone over the counter from a pharmacy or from peers without training and were therefore excluded from the analysis if they didn't also report formal training. Um, we do know that training is required by law for take-home naloxone distribution, and so we would suspect that this would form a small number of participants. Uh, either way, we wouldn't expect that including these participants could change the results. Well, sorry, I should say that take-home naloxone training was um, required for most of the study period. Third, and this is more of a limitation, I think, of all of the research conducted in this area, but take-home naloxone training is ultimately targeted to people who might witness an overdose, although, although, of course, it could be used on the person who accesses it themselves. But we didn't really ask participants whether they access naloxone for their own safety or for the sake of the people around them, or both. So perhaps for people who access naloxone um, to, who want to mitigate their own risk of overdose, there might be changes in their behaviour that weren't detected here. And finally, we didn't ask whether people had naloxone on them while they injected. 
And we know from other work that's currently in development that um, about half of people who access naloxone actually carry it on them regularly. So it might also be that people aren't engaging in risk compensation because they don't actually have naloxone while they're injecting. So what can we learn from this research? So first, our study contributes to the findings of the systematic review that suggests that there really is no evidence of a change in key overdose risk behaviours after take-home naloxone access. Um, so take-home naloxone should not be withheld due to concerns that people might engage in risk compensation. There is not enough evidence to substantiate that. Withholding naloxone due to these unsubstantiated concerns actually reinforces the health inequities that exist for people who are most at risk of an overdose. That's all from me. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Sam. That was fantastic. And unlike my, me, your slides worked, which is which is great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I, I gave you it all verbally, so you didn't miss out on anything. Um, we've we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, we've got some congrats to Sam coming through on the chat, but no questions as yet. Um, if you have a question of clarification of Sam, you can ask it now or uh, keep your powder dry and we'll pick it up after Serena's presentation. Okay, so seeing none, let's uh, hand over to Serena. Serena, over to you. Just letting you know, we don't have any audio, I don't think. Hello, everyone. Got you now. Thanks, Serena. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to present the main findings of the evaluation of the WA Police Force Naloxone pilot. This project was funded by the Mental Health Commission of Western Australia, and I would like to acknowledge Grace o, who used to work at the Mental Health Commission and who provided naloxone training to the WA Police Force, alongside with Mark Lowry and Rebecca Kraft. And I would also like to acknowledge my colleague, Professor Simon Lenton from Andrew, who was in charge of the evaluation of this project, and Lucas Stride from the WA Police Force. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge the Nyungar Wajuk people, traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to elders, past and present. So opioid overdose rates have been increasing steadily in the last 10 years and remain a public health concern around the world. In 2021, the most common drug type associated with unintentional drug induced deaths in Australia were due to opioids, which accounted for 46% of unintentional drug induced fatalities. Unintentional deaths involving opioids have almost doubled in Australia from 413 in 2001 to 765 in 2021. So why should police officers carry naloxone? So police officers are often the first emergency responders, responders and sometimes even the only ones on the scene of an opioid overdose. But the issue is that, unfortunately, they may not necessarily be equipped with naloxone, even though carrying naloxone enables to significantly reduce overdose harms and death while providing early naloxone intervention. So naloxone enables to buy time while waiting for the paramedics, and this can definitely make a big difference. For example, Rando and colleagues found that naloxone deaths decreased by an overall average of 13.4 fatalities each quarter after the implementation of an naloxone distribution program in the US. And another study conducted among police officers in the US also found that naloxone training was particularly effective in increasing competency in administering naloxone, as well as reducing concerns about administering it. Following the training, 81% of the sample responded that they had enough information about how to manage an overdose which was only the case for 10% of participants before the training. So this is quite a big difference. Similarly, 93% of participants reported that they were able to effectively deal with an overdose, what it was the case for only 32% of the sample before the training. 
Some studies also suggest that emergency responders, including police officers, but also emergency medical services and fire officers have higher risk compensation beliefs than other health and social providers. So as we've just seen in Sam's presentation, risk compensation beliefs have been described in the literature as the belief that access to naloxone will encourage drug use, as well as reduce the likelihood of seeking treatment, even though this is not true. For example, a study by Murphy and colleagues found that 83% of police officers believe that naloxone might encourage drug use, while 43% believe that there should be a limit on how often someone who overdoses receives naloxone. However, the good news is that naloxone training can significantly reduce these common beliefs, which are not supported by any evidence, as we've just seen in Sam's presentation. For example, a recent study conducted by Vinograd and colleagues found that police officers had fewer concerns, fewer negative attitudes, and less endorsement of risk compensation beliefs after receiving naloxone training. Another study by Smither and colleagues found that even though police officers had some concerns about using naloxone, 60% strongly agreed or just agreed that the benefits of the naloxone programs outweigh the risks. The perception of police officers in the public might also be improved by expanding access to naloxone, as it conveys the message that they are here to help the community and save lives. For example, it has been shown that police officers who have been trained in naloxone administration can also provide consumers with information about local drug treatment options and build positive interactions with the community members. As some people in the community might have negative perceptions about policing, even though their role is to help and protect the community. For example, a study conducted by Wagner in the US reported that about 20% of consumers who were administered naloxone by police officers sought, sought treatment after a police officer referral. So let's talk about a pilot now. So the pilot was publicly launched on the 1st of July, 2021, and ran until the 30th of July, 2022. During this period of time, 447 police officers were trained by the Mental Health Commission in administering naloxone. The Mental Health Commission ran 40 training sessions across 14 metro and two regional locations in WA. The team's train were very diverse and included police officers from, for example, the Watch House and the Bike Squad. And the WA police officers became the first police officers in the Southern Hemisphere to carry naloxone. The day the pilot was launched, we had lots of media, print, radio, and socials, even from international newspapers, and all of it was very positive and well received by police officers, but also by consumers. In order to assess the effectiveness of the pilot, the 447 police officers who had received naloxone training were requested to complete a pre and post questionnaire before the beginning of the training and just at the end of the training as well. The questionnaires included, for example, questions about the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, what needs to be done when witnessing an opioid overdose. And 270 partic uh, 72 participants completed pre- and post-questionnaires. They were also requested to complete an online follow-up survey three to six months after the completion of their training, which included, for example, questions about the quality of the training itself, knowledge retention, access and availability of naloxone, and 117 participants completed the, the online survey. Participants who had administered naloxone since receiving their training were then invited to complete a follow-up interview over the phone, and eight police officers agreed to be interviewed. So now I'm just going to focus on the pre and post questionnaires that the participants completed just before the training and at the end of the training. And participants' soci sociodemographic status was not collected when completed pre and post questionnaires, as these questionnaires were provided to the police officers by the Mental Health Commission and were mainly focusing on knowledge retention. But overall, there was increased knowledge after the training in terms of recognizing the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, as you can see on the table. And I'm just going to give you a few minutes to have a look at the, at the table. And there was also increased knowledge after the training in terms of recognizing the signs, which increased the risk of an opioid overdose. And all these results were um, significant.
There was also an increase in the number of participants who said that they would administer naloxone after the completion of the training. For example, 66% of participants said that yes, they would administer naloxone before the training, and this went up to 99% after the training, which is very positive. And there was also an increase in the number of participants who felt more confident to respond to an opioid overdose after having received naloxone training, as only 35% of respondents initially said that they were either confident or very confident to respond to an opioid overdose before the training, while 97% of participants responded that they were either confident or very confident to respond to an opioid overdose after the training. So now I'm going to focus on the follow-up online survey that the participants completed three to six months after the completion of the training. So who were the 117 police officers who completed the online follow-up survey? So they had a mean age of 30 year, 38 years, ranging from 19 to 63 years. The majority of them were males with a length of service of 134 months, so approximately 11 years of service. As you can see on the table, 94% of police officers thought that the quality of the training was excellent or good. 90% of them felt that their competence to administer naloxone increased after the training, and 100% completely agreed or just agreed that they would now be able to administer naloxone in the case of an opioid overdose, which is very positive again. In terms of the attitudes toward naloxone, 92% of police officers completely agreed or agreed that everyone at risk of witnessing an opioid overdose should be given naloxone. 97% completely agreed or just agreed that it was reassuring to have access to naloxone. And 90% of police officers completely agreed or agreed that police officers should have access to naloxone. One hundred percent also completely agreed or agreed that they would call an ambulance and commence first aid, uh, first aid if someone overdoses. And twenty percent of respondents witnessed an opioid overdose since the training. And when we asked them how many times they had resuscitated someone using naloxone since receiving their training, forty-four percent of police officers responded once, and thirty percent responded none, which means that naloxone might have been deployed by the colleagues or the paramedics. And lastly, I'm going to share with you some insightful quotes that were gathered during our qualitative phone interviews. So several participants reported that they were very grateful for using naloxone and also reported that naloxone in enabled them to provide early intervention by buying time before St. John Ambulance took over. I'm just going to give you some minutes to read this quote. Several participants also reported that they felt good to have sa uh, saved someone's life, as you can see. And again, I'm just going to give you um, a few seconds to read that. Along these lines, another police officer said, for example, that policing these days is quite negative and it don't get that good feeling sometimes after being in a job. So he was very grateful to be now able to do that as part of his uh, job and felt very good about it. And several participants also highlighted the fact that it gave them a sense of confidence to go ahead as there was minimal harm to administer naloxone to someone who didn't need it, for example. All right, so to sum up, our findings show that the training was well received by police officers. It seems to be effective in increasing police officers' knowledge associated with drug overdose and improve their capacity to recognize and manage opioid overdoses. These results are in line with prior research, which suggests that expanding naloxone access to police officers enables to significantly reduce the risk of opioid overdose fatalities. 
And to conclude, carriage of naloxone by police officers in Australia is feasible, effective, and may save lives. It should serve as an example for other jurisdictions to roll out similar programs. And the good news is that following the pilot, all police officers in WA will now be carrying naloxone, as announced on the 14th of August by Police Minister Paul Vavalia and Health Minister Amber Jade Sanderson, so, which is um, great news. All right, so thank you so much for your time today. Please feel free to ask me um, any questions.